So I saw the greatest picture online today of Michael Myers. He's holding a, uh, a giant knife with a ribbon wrapped around it and a nice pretty bow. And it says, I found the perfect gift for you. It would look so great in you. <laughs> Again, here with Shore Manor, and we're excited to be doing our second podcast. And for this podcast, we have decided to go with our top eight favorite Halloween movies. Before we get started, we would like to go ahead and apologize in case you hear any of the storming in the background that's storming right now where we are, but we feel that goes pretty perfect because yes. I mean. It's no better to watch a scary movie than on a stormy night. Am I right? It's true. You really could not ask for a better atmosphere than we have right now. So I have chosen to do mine in a countdown from the, my least favorite to my most favorite, and Matt has chosen to do his in chronological order of when the movies came out. So you can imagine how fun it is in our house when we get a new movie and we try to stack it on the shelf because I want it to go... As far as, like, my favorite movies, and that is like, no, it either has to be in alphabetical order or when the films are released. It's the, it's the comic book collector in me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, I'm going to get started, because I think my countdown is way more fun than what he's decided to do. That's so wrong. <laughs> so... All right, number eight on my list is Casper. If you have never seen this movie, I highly recommend it. I, of course, am not super into scary things. I know I catch a lot of flack over that for Halloween. If you listened to our first podcast, you heard a little bit about that. Um, I do catch a lot of flack over being someone who loves Halloween but isn't into super scary stuff. So my movies are more family and kid-friendly movies, and Matt's are more the slasher films that I refuse to ever watch. <laughs> so, if you've never seen Casper, um, it stars Christina Ricci, whom I love. I think everyone who loves Halloween-ish movies loves her. And it's about her and her dad moving into this mansion that's haunted, and because her dad is someone who actually researches ghosts, and it's about how he helps the ghosts that live there. The legendary Bill Pullman. Yes. Uh, we are shifting gears over to my own uh, countdown. I'm going to start things off uh, with the Universal Monster movie uh, Dracula, starring the immortal Bela Lugosi. And uh, for my money, this is the horror film by which every horror film is compared. This film is actually why I do not watch scary movies, because I did watch it when I was eight years old, and it terrified me. This movie is so incredibly well done. There are just things about it. It knows when to be over the top, and it knows when to be subtle. And everybody right now, whatever image you have of Dracula, I guarantee you it was influenced by Bela Lugosi. He made this character. He owned this character. The only person who ever came close was Christopher Lee in the upcoming, the following Hammer film series. But uh, I think even he would acknowledge that Lugosi is the true innovator, the true legend of Dracula. This is uh, one of the best of all time. Uh, it's going to be hard to, to ever top it. And this is really why I went with uh, chronological order, because it's really hard for me to rate some of these. So many of these are so fantastic. Mm. <laughs> All right, coming in at number seven on my list is the movie Under Wraps. I am not sure if this movie was actually a Disney Channel original movie. I don't think that it was, but I saw it on the Disney Channel. And it stars Adam Wiley, Mario Yadidia. I, I don't know if I, I probably butchered that. I couldn't say it any better, I'm sure. Clara Bryant and Bill Fagerbeck. Sure. Um, and this is about three kids who come across a mummy. Um, it's actually in a creepy old house. I remember the guy's name is Mr. Kubot, and he actually fakes his own death. And what happens is, is he's stealing these ancient Egyptian artifacts and selling them for money. 
and he's about to get caught, so he fakes his own death. And there's, like, a curse or something on the mummy, and the mummy comes to life, and the three kids are the only ones that know and can figure out how to help him. Well, they go to um, an adult who owns, like, a, what kind of a store? Like, a... It's, 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 it's almost like, like a, a weird boutique yeah, for, for men. <laughs> it's, it's um, a store that... Houses a lot of Halloween decorations and things like that, and all these books. And of course, they find the curse in the book and how to break it. And so, the four of them the three kids and this adult male, whose name escapes me at the moment um, end up getting this mummy back to his coffin and back to his wife. Yes, the mummy has a wife in the movie. Um, it's a real sweet movie. I love it. This, this film actually uh, has a little special place in my own heart because I relate so much to the main character in this because he's this Marshall. big... Marshall is this big horror movie fan and like, he talks about uh, the, the characters in these horror movies that his friends are just terrified and repulsed by and he's like, these are remarkable, wonderful family family men. Why do you have such a problem with them? And it, I just... Uh, that was me at his age so many ways. Still is. Still is, yes. Uh, speaking of which... Uh, Another wonderful family film uh, for my money, uh, the immortal Boris Karloff as Frankenstein. Yet another entry in the the Universal franchise. Um, this film and subsequently the follow up, um, The Bride of Frankenstein, one of the rare cases where the sequel is almost better than the original. Uh, it's so epic. It's so legendary. And again, like uh, Lugosi with Dracula, uh, everybody's image of Frankenstein is made by this movie. There have been so many different versions of Frankenstein over the years. Uh, Hammer took a turn at it. Uh, they've been made for TV films. I know TNT had one that they did. Uh, and they're all worthy entries. Uh, you know, come to think of it, even the legendary Robert De Niro was Frankenstein's monster in one film, but nobody compares to Karloff. He, mm -hmm. he made it. He owned it. He is it. Uh, his career suffered a little bit because of that afterwards, but uh, he will always be a legend because of this film. And it's another one of those, uh, in addition to his performance, it's just so well done. Uh, the, the, the Universal films, they were just on. They knew what they were doing. They had the atmosphere. They had the mood. They had the characters. They knew when to be funny, and they knew when to be scary. Uh, just another, another one of those where I can't say it's better than Dracula. I can't say it's worse. They're both just iconic. All right, coming in at number five for me, sorry, I lost count there for a minute, <laughs> I'm not good at math, is the movie Beetlejuice, starring, of course, Michael Keaton, Alec Baldwin, and I believe it's, oh, Gina Davis, I was going to say Winona Ryder, but that, she is in the movie, a very young Winona Ryder. This one might almost be as iconic and legendary as uh, Frankenstein and Dracula in my, yes. my book. I highly doubt that there's a person out there who has yet to see Beetlejuice, but if you have not seen it, I highly recommend it. It is full of laughs from beginning to end, and it's a very, it's just a very sweet movie. Um, it's about a couple who ends up dying on a bridge, so I know it sounds like a downer, but... They come back as ghosts, and um, it's about the people that move into their house, and they're trying to scare them out, and Beetlejuice comes and helps, and ends up making a disaster of everything. <laughs> this movie is so weird, too, in all the right ways. It, it is. It's weird, but funny. That's perfect. And, like, only Tim Burton could take a scene right. where a couple dies in a car wreck off a bridge and actually make it kind of twisted and funny. You sort of yeah. laugh about it when it happens. Moving on to uh, one of my own films, uh, my last uh, one that I'm going to put into the uh, Universal franchise is uh, The Wolfman, starring Lon Chaney Jr. Uh, werewolf movies are really difficult, if uh, time has taught us anything. There are a bunch of werewolf movies out there, and almost without exception, they are all terrible. I don't know why people get this wrong. Uh, it seems like such an easy formula. You have this tragic monster where uh, the monster is deadly and killing people and you've got to do something about it, but at the same time, when he's not a monster, he's actually a nice person. So you've got this perfect story, and yet they keep on screwing it up. I can't quite figure that out. But uh, 
Lon Chaney Jr. did not screw it up. He nails this role yet again. Uh, he's not quite as iconic, I suppose, as uh, Karloff and Lugosi. Uh, in that sense, he might take a little bit of a step down. But um, the whole idea of a wolf man, half man, half wolf, uh, where you can still see him, he's still wearing clothes of a man, but you can tell he's not human, That that, that is completely Lon Chaney Jr. He's the one who gave us that image. And for my money, I've always preferred that portrayal where he actually looks kind of human rather than just turning into this big giant wolf. Uh, the sort of unnaturalness of looking like part man, part wolf to me makes it a bit more scary and a bit more compelling. So uh, this is a, a really good film. And um, yet yeah, this is what I think, Amanda, you tried... You tried watching this with me once, didn't you? Did, did we make it through this one? Yes, we made it through all of the old Universal movies. Oh, but but it was a chore. No, I like the I like the black and white Universal movies. I do. It's the rest of the horror movies I don't like. I can handle these. Um, <laughs> I actually um, I'm a big fan of the Wolfman movies. Um, this one, and also I liked the remake that came out a few years ago. We actually went and saw that for Valentine's Day because uh, it was like the same year the movie Valentine's Day came out. So we saw the Wolfman, A, because it's just us, and B, because we knew Valentine's Day the movie would be packed. It's true. So it just um, made sense to go. I am. Once. I'm a fan. I can handle monsters that are animals, just not monsters that are people. So Godzilla, the Wolfman. So which means that for my films, it's pretty much all going to be downhill from here. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I realized why I got mixed up earlier. I have all my DVDs in front of me, and I did skip number six. So I'm going to go back to number six real quick. Um, number six for me is Disney's The Tower of Terror, which I have heard is a movie that they made based on the ride, that the ride was already in place and they made the movie after that. I'm not sure if that's true or not. Um, so if anybody knows, contact me on short, on our Facebook page, Shore Manor, facebook.com slash Shore Manor. Let me know. Um, if you haven't seen this movie, I absolutely recommend it. Um, it's super cute. It is. It stars Steve Gutenberg and a very young Kirsten Dunst. Steve Gutenberg, a true national treasure. <laughs> um, in the movie, Steve Gutenberg is a struggling journalist, and he's looking for that next big story. And there's a story about the Hollywood Tower Hotel that there was a party, and all these guests never made it, and they disappeared. It turns out they're ghosts, and so just like with the other movies I have already talked about, the, it's about Steve Gutenberg and his niece, played by Kirsten Dunst, helping these ghosts out. I actually got a kick out of that film. Um, the uh, sometimes a uh, cutesy to me doesn't always work with uh, with horror films. But uh, I don't know. This one really has some charm. Uh, it could just be because it's Steve Gutenberg, and I, I mean, he was, has so many great films from the '80s, and he's really on in this one too. Uh, it could also be that uh, I saw this and then did the ride and then watched it again, and it just ended up with a special place in my heart. But uh, I, I do get a kick out of Tower of Terror. It's, it's a fun one, and it's definitely one that always goes on our list every October. <laughs> Now we're going to move into the films that Amanda refuses to have anything to do with. Uh, we're still black. No. It's still black and white, however. I want to make a note of that. This is... But it's not universal. It's not universal. Uh, no, this was an independent film made by the legendary George Romero. This is Night of the Living Dead. A lot of people tend to skip over this one and go right to Dawn of the Dead. That one's become a bit more of an icon in the horror film industry. But uh, for me, I feel like Night of the Living Dead uh, really... I mean, that's the one that set the stage for the zombie movies as we know it. Um, Dawn of the Dead really cemented uh, the way it all works, but Night of the Living Dead is what got that going. And just on its own, it is a fantastic horror film. Uh, the way that it's shot, the black and white, just works for this thing. Uh, it gives it just this really uh, grim, dreadful feel and uh, just this real uh, sort of isolation that everyone has as they're locked in this house for the night while these uh, uh, undead ghouls are prowling around outside and they have to just find some way to survive the night. Um, 
Uh, ironically, uh, the zombie film, as people know it today, uh, is one of those where it's like this outbreak or disease or whatever, and zombies, people rise from the dead, and then it's that way forever. Society falls, and then like we're just picking up the pieces. But in Night of the Living Dead, it actually kind of has a, at least on the broad scope of things, it has a happy ending because uh, they, the, it, it's the whole thing is caused by a uh, comet flying overhead, and when the comet passes the next day, uh, people are able to come back out and sort of bring things back to normal. Uh, the only downside is uh, all of the main characters end up dead before it's over with. Hmm. <laughs> Sounds very uplifting. It, it's, yes, it's a, it's a charming, uh, bright, happy film for, for everyone to, in the family to enjoy. All right, my next three movies are actually a trilogy, so I'm going to do number four, number three, and number two all at the same time. You're actually the, going to include number four? No, oh. you're not listening. I apologize. My next three movies okay. are a trilogy. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I got my numbering wrong. So, number four is Halloween Town High. Number three, of course, would be Halloween Town 2, Calabar's Revenge. And number one would be Halloween Town. These movies star Kimberly J. Brown and, of course, the late and great Debbie Reynolds. I would say that a lot of my love of Halloween is because of Debbie Reynolds in these movies. These are DCOMs, Disney Channel Original Movies. And I actually watched, I think I watched all three of them as they premiered. But I remember for sure that I watched Halloween Town as it premiered. And the very first scene, it's dark and there's this jack-o'-lantern that's lit up and the candle's flickering. And I actually thought, I was young when I watched this, and I actually thought, this might be too scary for me. <laughs> it's just based on that opening scene. But I decided to give it a couple of minutes. Um, if you haven't seen them, they're amazing movies, especially if you're not a big Halloween fan. These will make you a fan of Halloween. You will love it. Um, I'm not going to give too much away because it is a trilogy. I'm just going to kind of quickly go over it because it will be very easy to give away the, a lot of things about the second movie. <laughs> so, the gist of the story is Kimberly J. Brown... Her character's name is Marnie. And Kimberly J. Brown is only half witch. Her mother was a witch. Her grandmother is Debbie Reynolds, of course. Uh, Grandma Aggie. And her father was human. And in the Halloween Town universe, if a witch does not start practicing her powers by her 13th Halloween, by the stroke of midnight on her 13th Halloween, then she will become human, which is what Marnie's mother wants. Um, however, something bad is happening in Halloween Town, and so Grandma Aggie comes to visit, and people from Halloween Town can only come over on Halloween night. So, Marnie and her two younger siblings end up following their grandmother back and figuring out that, yes, Marnie is a witch, and Marnie does practice her powers, and she becomes a witch and helps Grandma Aggie save Halloween Town. And in Halloween Town 2, Calabar's Revenge, um, something happens again in Halloween Town, and Marnie and her sister actually figure out how to open the portal so that they can travel between worlds whenever they want. Halloween Town High is um, set in the mortal world, and some exchange students from Halloween Town come over because. They are trying to see if they can bridge the gap between the mortal world and the magical world. And um, there's some pretty some interesting things that happen during that movie as well. Now, if you know about the Halloween Town franchise, you will know that there is a fourth movie. Um, I can't honestly can't even think of the name of it right now. Because it did not star Kimberly J. Brown. And so, if you're a true Halloween Town fan, you know that that one does not even count. So, no, it is not on my list. There is an, a, another movie that I have that will be number one. Um, so, these are number four, number three, and number two on my list. So, it'll be safe to say that uh, Halloween Town 4 is viewed by Halloween Town... Town fans the same way that Star Wars fans are viewing The Last Jedi? Yes. Okay. 
Oh, and I think it's which university. I know she went to name. college. Yeah. yeah. This is one that uh, I didn't even know existed until we started dating. And uh, once we watched it, I just remember thinking, how in the world did I did miss you know these? Where, my gosh, where was I? Uh, I mean, they're not, uh, granted, they're not the uh, typical scary fair that I would have been into as a teenager, but uh, there's just this fun to them all. Uh, it's just a great time sitting down and watching them. Like, it, it would have been one that if it had been on TV and I'd known about it, I would have gladly sat down and watched it. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those uh, lost moments of childhood that I'll, I'll never be able to get, but uh, at least I get to relive now that we're together. Mm -hmm. Shifting gears, uh, we'll move over uh, to something a little bit darker. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go through the whole series, but I'm going to, uh, for this entry, say Friday the 13th. Uh, uh, here's a, a quick uh, trivia question for you, darling. Um, who's the killer in Friday the 13th? Jason? Ah, you do not win the prize. That's a, I don't know. I'm just no. looking at the DVD and it looks like a Jason mask. Most, most people who have not seen this get that wrong. Uh, no, in the first film, it's actually Jason's mother. Jason's mother does all the killing in that film, and then uh, after that, Jason takes over from her. Uh, this is one of those where uh, if somebody was asking me to tell you that this is some sort of great piece of cinema, honestly, I cannot say that. Um, I do not mean that as a detriment to this film, because in its own right it has some charm and it was extremely innovative for its day. Um, I, I think a lot of the uh, effects that are in this film by today's standards, um, it's not that they don't hold up well, they certainly do, but to, I think to many of today's audiences this stuff is just not a big deal anymore because with computers so much of it's so easy. Uh, in this film, they didn't have computers. They had to set up these elaborate rigs and uh, props and stuff to make this stuff happen and make it look good. And uh, so much of it holds up today. It looks really phenomenal and uh, like genuinely horrifying. Um, and if you don't know what's coming, um, the the twist at the end when you, when you find out uh, that who the killer is, it's uh, what you thought was this sweet, kindly old lady. Uh, it can it can really catch you off guard if you're not prepared for it. So, you can watch it now because you would know what's coming, right? Nope. No? Oh, okay. Just now. No? <laughs> All right, well, since uh, Amanda went through three films in a row, I will move on to the next one. This, for my money, not only defines the slasher films, it is the absolute best of all of the slasher films that came out in the 80s, and that is, of course, Nightmare on Elm Street, starring the legendary Robert England and directed by the legendary and late, rest in peace, Wes Craven. This film is, there's everything about this movie is like, it's almost perfect in my eyes as a horror film goes because uh, it makes just absolutely the best use of the effects that it has, the limited budget that it has. Um, it's moody, it's atmospheric, uh, it's weird because so much of it is in dreams. And dreams, you know, if you really think about it, dreams are weird. So there are just so many moments in this film where just weird stuff happens without any explanation other than just kind of accept the fact that it's a dream. Even by today's standards, I feel like uh, this is a truly creepy and uh, unsettling uh, film. It can really put you on edge. Uh, the, the concept itself of uh, there's this something lurking in your dreams waiting to get you, uh, that's just a truly uh, a scary thought because, I mean, you can't stay awake forever. Mm. Sooner or later, you're going to have to face it. And uh, that's the ultimate... Um, uh, plot here is uh, the main character, uh, Nancy, who is uh, avoiding this monster and escaping him constantly at every turn. Uh, finally, at the very end, she has to face him and ultimately uh, ultimately defeat him. A uh, little uh, fun bit of trivia, uh, Wes Craven originally wanted this film to have a happy ending. Like, Freddy would be defeated, Nancy would win, and all would be well. But uh, the producer, uh, Bob Shea, uh, recognized that uh, there was a, some franchise possibilities here, so he wanted it to be left open-ended that Freddie might still be alive. And uh, since he was the money man, that's, that's the way that they went. Interesting. <laughs> still, she's still not going to give it any, uh, any kudos mm -hmm. at all whatsoever. 
Um, she might give this next one a little bit, though. Uh, this is um, shifting a gear a lot. Uh, it's one of those that some might question me including it as a horror film, but it does follow all of the tropes, and that is Ghostbusters. Mm, I do love Ghostbusters. This film is another one of those where it just nails everything. And the big reason why I consider this a horror film, at the very least a horror comedy, is uh, the, the whole feel that you're genuinely going for with a horror film is you're watching it, you're tensing up, this big scary thing happens, you jump, and then you laugh at yourself for being so scared because it's just a movie. Well, Ghostbusters takes that and just makes it a movie where you're tense, you're on edge, something scary makes you jump, and then it becomes something hysterical, and you're just laughing at not only yourself for getting scared, but the, the movie itself because it's just, it is such a genius piece of cinema. I do love Ghostbusters. It is one of my favorites to watch, and someday we hope to have a Stave Puff Marshmallow Man in our yard. Oh, yes. That, <laughs> it's the only <laughs> way I will ever invest in an inflatable. Yeah, the yeah. only inflatable we would ever use for Halloween. Unless I could ever find a way to actually somehow build a giant Mr. Stay Puff, like with his hands on either side of the house peeking over the roof, that would be pretty cool. Mm. <laughs> All right, drum roll, please. My number one movie is, of course, Hocus Pocus. Hocus Pocus is, without a doubt, the Halloween movie. I think everyone, young and old... I will, um, I will say amen to that. Whether you love family movies or you hate them, everyone loves Hocus Pocus. I have yet to meet one person that has seen the movie that hates it. Everyone loves it. Um, so if you haven't seen it, which I highly doubt, but if you haven't seen Hocus Pocus, it stars Bette Midler, Sarah Jessica Parker, and Kathy and Jimmy as the Sanderson sisters. The Sanderson sisters are three witches that were hung in 1692, which if you're a history buff, you will recognize that as the date of all of the Salem witch trials. Um, and, of course, they were the Salem witches. The movie is set in Salem. There's a lot of it that was actually filmed there. Um, I think we mentioned this on our previous podcast, but we actually did go to Salem last October. This film is the reason we went to Salem. <laughs> we went to Salem because of this film, and we learned a lot of the history of the town and a lot about the true Salem witch trials. And... Um, Salem is just an amazing place to go. We highly recommend it to anyone, whether you love Hocus Pocus or not. Um, there's a lot of maritime history there. And just to see the town and the features of the houses and everything is just amazing up there. I think visiting Salem made me love this movie even more because if now... If it's possible, yeah. Yeah, if it's possible because now when I see different scenes that were shot on places that we were at, I'm, I'll start jumping up and down and po pointing at the screen. We were there! We were there! We were there! He watched this movie twice within 24 hours of us being home from Salem last year. We watched it within the last 24 hours of recording this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> that is true. I uh, did some YouTube searches um, about other people to see other people's experiences in Salem. Um, so anyways, um, the film, the three Sanderson sisters, they're hung. Um, there is the notorious black flame candle that if lit by a virgin on Halloween night, will bring them back to life in the way that they survive as they suck the lives out of children. So, of course, in the movie, the black flame candle is lit by a virgin on Halloween night. And, and they and constantly keep referencing that yes, moment. This they poor boy, he can never <laughs> catch a break. Um, they get a lot of mileage out of that. It is about all of the chaos that ensues once the witches are back, and of course about defeating them. It's also one of those where you can sometimes you just see a movie or a TV show and you can just feel the joy that the people are in this 
project. Like you can just tell they're having the time of their lives with it. Bette Midler especially. Mm -hmm. I just feel like every scene when she got done, she just had to be on some kind of high. Like this is the best time of my life. She has said, even in recent interviews, that playing Winifred Sanderson was her favorite role that she's ever done, which I can imagine. It's good. It is. It's we good. watch it um, pretty much on a loop on Halloween night. We have uh, Matt's parents come over, and we have dinner, and we hand out, you know, candy to the trick-or-treaters, and we just play Hocus Pocus on a loop. We usually average it about three times from the time that his parents get here until the time they leave, just playing it over and over and over. And over and over and over. Yeah. I try to sneak Halloween Town in there as well, because they all also take place on Halloween night, but... Um, that's the thing for me. I like Halloween movies that take place on Halloween night. All right, well, last one on my list is The Monster Squad. Uh, hearkening back to those universal monsters, yes. because this one pits Dracula, the Wolfman, Frankenstein, uh, the Mummy, the Creature from the Black Lagoon, yeah. against, uh, basically it's the Goonies. A team of kids, yeah. yes. A team of young kids in this uh, um, New England town are the only ones who stand a chance at stopping these monsters from literally unleashing hell on Earth. You know, it's a charming coming-of-age story, kind of like Stand By Me. <laughs> it's a cult classic. Yes, this this film, um, I, like so many people my, my age, discovered this uh, in home video. Uh, this film was not a success in uh, theaters. As a matter of fact, I mean, it, I think it was considered a dismal failure. Like, it may, it didn't just lose, it didn't just not make money, it lost money and lots of it. Like, I think careers ended because of this film. Uh, but, uh, because so many people like me, when home video was a thing back then, which is, I'm aging myself by talking about this, but, uh, uh so many of us discovered it there, and there are so many people that know about this film. And they tried, they ended up re-releasing it at one point, I, I think, kind of a limited release in theaters, just thinking, well, well, we'll see how this does. And when they did it, uh, there were, uh, the places where they were showing it, there were lines around the block of uh, a bunch of 30-plus-year-old men who cut their teeth on this film on home video. It's like, oh my gosh, I've got to go back and see the Monster Squad again. <laughs> Yeah, it's one I didn't know about until we started dating, and it's one of my favorites to watch on Halloween as well. Yeah, it's another one of those that, uh, it, it's just, it's fun, it's charming. Um, and it, it is a coming-of-age story for these kids. They, I mean, they deal with some pretty rough stuff in this movie. That's true. Um, you know, uh, the kids, uh... They have their own little club, and they're just, uh, yet again, I related to this so much because they loved horror movies and they loved monsters, and that was me at that age. That's what I was into. And uh, they're sort of ostracized in a way by the others at their school they're, because they're kind of mm -hmm. dorky, they're nerdy, and yeah. to top it all off, in addition to that, they like monsters, which uh, is not, in those days, was not considered as cool yeah. as it is today. <laughs> So I, I related to these kids a lot. And, you know, another thing, a little slight fact, uh, this film, in my opinion, has one of the best-looking werewolves. Uh, I, I've heard a lot of criticism for it, but to me, it's... it's uh, I, I've, I said it a moment ago that I, I like it when your werewolf you're, is an actual wolf man. He's, he, he's, he still looks kind of human. And uh, this one does. It's... it's yeah, it's it's... So much fun and, and things I could say about this film, but uh, just just go check it out. Yeah, I, I don't think I can recommend this one enough. And I think you would be hard-pressed to find another man my age who would uh, tell you otherwise. The Monster Squad. Mm -hmm. With uh, what what is undoubtedly the whitest-sounding rap theme song a film could ever ask for during the ending credits. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for listening in. We hope that you have enjoyed this podcast as much as we have enjoyed making it. 
drop us a comment, facebook.com slash Shore Manor. We will be posting the link to this podcast on there. And feel free to recommend any of your own films because I know there are so many that I left out. I can think yeah, of that. that's what I was going to say, but yeah. he interrupted me. I was going to say, leave us a comment. Tell us which of these movies is your favorite or tell us some that you have that we haven't mentioned on here. There's a good chance we've seen it. We just didn't. Or if we haven't, we would love to see them. Absolutely. And stay tuned for episode or podcast number three. We haven't officially decided what it's going to be yet. Um, Probably going to be along the lines of props, either indoor or outdoor props. We'll think of something. Yeah, you can also vote on Facebook. Tell us what you want us to talk about first, indoor props or outdoor props. Check out our pictures and tell us what you want to know more about. (laughs) And so, as always, uh, as we like to say here at Shore Manor, Happy haunting. haunting.